In 811, Michael I Rangabi inherited one of the worst situations that any emperor had faced in recent memory, and by 813 he had been deposed by a rival. Most historians tend to view Michael as being inept and completely unsuited for imperial command. So in this video I want to examine that. Was Michael the supreme bungler, or was he simply placed in a situation that was untenable and that even a much more talented ruler could not have succeeded in. Let's find out by taking a look at Michael's life and reign. The future Emperor Michael was born around 770, and he was the son of a prominent patrician named Theophylact Rangabi, who was the Admiral of the Aegean Fleet. At some point in his adult life, Michael married Nikephorus's daughter Procopia, now, this marriage took place prior to Nikephorus' rise to power, and it doesn't appear to have been politically motivated, i.e., Nikephorus did not seek out Michael as a son-in-law to shore up his imperial administration, and Michael was not using Procopia as a way to get to power. I mean, most likely this marriage had some aristocratic underpinnings that aren't clear right now, and it was mutually beneficial to both families, since that tends to be how aristocratic marriages work, but there's really no reason to suspect that either Michael or his father-in-law Nikephorus knew that imperial power was in their immediate future. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, Michael's family was a noble one. They were patricians. And Michael, because he is the first emperor to have a family name, Rangabi, um, this is seen as being emblematic of the rise of distinctive aristocratic houses, and we'll see that a lot of future emperors after Michael will also have family names like this. And I might be wrong on this, but I think that Theophylact Rangabi may have actually been the first person listed, at least in the sources, to have a distinctive family name like that. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not 100% on that like I said. In the summer of 811, the emperor Nikephorus embarked upon his fateful Bulgar campaign which culminated in the Battle of Pliska. Unfortunately, Nikephorus took a whole host of senior officials with him, including his son and heir, Starachius, and his son-in-law, Michael Rangabi. Unlike most of the other senior leaders present at Pliska, Michael was not only able to escape, but he escaped unharmed. So, he had his full health, and this piece of good luck when compared with the horrible fates of so many others, especially Nikephorus, who became a drinking cup, and his son Starachius, who was mortally wounded, this may have given Michael something of an aura of divine protection or destiny, and this may have played a role in making him appear to be an imperial contender, whereas he might not have been regarded in that light before this. The catastrophe at Pliska occurred on July 26th, 811, and for the next three months, the future of the empire remained in doubt. Now, Starachius had been co-emperor with his father Nikephorus since 803, and now he just assumed sole command of the empire. However, it was pretty obvious to everyone that he was mortally wounded, and that he was not physically capable of sustaining life long enough to rule the empire effectively for any extended period of time. So, a lot of people began to look for other options. Starachius doesn't seem to have really accepted his fate, however, and he was trying to set up his wife as a potential successor. And for reasons that we don't know, Starachius neither liked nor trusted Michael, and at one point he tried to order one of his subordinates to put Michael to death, but he was talked out of it. Um, meanwhile, while all of this was going on, maybe Starachius's suspicions were correct because Michael was working with these senior officials, including the patriarch Nikephorus, and the official whose name I can't remember who was the guy talking with Starachis about killing Michael, and they all decided as a group that Michael should be the next emperor. So they worked together to secure his elevation, and Michael decided to take his son Theophylact as his co-emperor. This elevation occurred in public in Constantinople in October of 811, and when Starachis received news of it, he knew that the jig was up, he accepted Michael's elevation and abdicated. He became a monk until his death in early 811, or I mean early 812, excuse me, um, where his wounds finally took him. 
and now Michael the first Rangabi was the Emperor. So let's look at how Michael performed as Emperor. Once Michael became Emperor in October of 811, it quickly became apparent that he was not a very good Emperor. Um, he just really didn't have it. So on paper, he had experience and he also had a lot of good connections. As we've seen, his father was a famous admiral, his father-in-law ended up becoming Emperor, um, he came from a house which was prominent enough to have a name, something that was a new trend and meant that his family was one of the most powerful in the state. So you would think that between all of these things that he was uh, pretty well off, not to mention that he had managed to work with all of the remaining senior imperial officials, including the patriarch, and he had all of them on his side. Um, he was at a pretty favorable age for rulership. He was around 40, which means that he was old enough to have experience and command respect, but he wasn't old. Um, he was healthy. We know that just by the fact that he lives for a long time after his reign ends. And he was also considered to be handsome, which would have helped him be more charming and, um, you know, get along with people. So on paper, you would think that Michael seems like a pretty good candidate. However, it turns out that he is pretty easy to manipulate, especially in matters of religion. And this is because Michael was driven by an excessive piety. And because of his overweening desire to really please the ecclesiastical figures of his day, he became a puppet in the hands of people like Patriarch Narciphorus and Theodore of Studium, the famous zealot monk. Another problem with Michael is that he tended to not be very decisive. Uh, he was pretty hard-pressed to make decisions in a timely fashion, and to put it bluntly, he just wasn't all that intelligent. Um, at least not on matters of state. So between all of these flaws, he was pretty hopeless when it came to being an emperor in a time of crisis. So what exactly did Michael inherit and how dire was the crisis? In 811, the Byzantine state was now on solid financial footing thanks to the work of Nicephorus. However, it was also militarily exposed in the west thanks to Nicephorus. The debacle at Pliska had really eliminated the Western army, and the Byzantines would be vulnerable in the West for a few years. His key advisors at this time were the Patriarch Nicephorus and Theodore of Studium. Now, as mentioned above, these two guys had a lot of influence with Michael because he admired their piety and positions within the church. However, the two of them gave contradictory advice and were bitter arch rivals. Um, Patriarch Nicephorus was someone who was a member of, I guess what you would call the power establishment, whereas Theodore of Studium was someone who was for the strict enforcement of church law, and uh, those two views were not very easily compatible. Michael also inherited the diplomatic problem of dealing with Charlemagne's imperial claims. Um, these claims were still deeply distasteful to the Byzantine emperors because these claims took away what made them special. So Michael would have to deal with that. But the main challenge, again, comes from this military exposure post Pliska, and that threat is posed in the person of Khan Krum of the Bulgars, the guy who had inflicted the defeat at Pliska. So these are the primary challenges that Michael will deal with in the less than two years that he holds the throne. Um, early on, after he is selected, he enjoys two lavish coronation ceremonies about a week apart for himself and then for his wife. Um, and between those two events, I would have to say that marks the peak of Michael I's reign. Once he came to power, Michael's first concern was to try to consolidate power, and the best way to do that was to make friends with all the people who could be potential rivals or enemies. So first of all, he eased up on Nicephorus's tax collection. Now this may seem foolhardy at first since he had a new army he needed to build, however the elite landowning class was always a potential threat and this was one of Michael's methods for trying to win their favor. He also distributed generous gifts to the army, church, and bureaucracy to win their favor as well, since being opposed by major figures in the church could make him unpopular with the people, 
and the army posed pretty obvious threats. He also agreed to recognize Charlemagne's claim partially. So he agreed to recognize Charlemagne as Basileus, the Greek word for king, which by this point basically meant emperor. Um, most of the Byzantine emperors called themselves Basileus as their primary title, even if that was not technically correct. But Michael did not acknowledge Charlemagne as emperor of the Romans. So it was kind of a weird passive-aggressive solution, and I think it was mainly aimed at his own subjects who could potentially be aggrieved if he were to simply accept Charlemagne's claims. So he accepted enough of Charlemagne's claims to keep peace between the two empires, but also, um, you know, still didn't give him what he had asked for exactly. So it's definitely a passive-aggressive move, but it, in this one instance, actually ended up not being a bad one. Um, this was maybe Michael's greatest policy. And a lot of people think that this was a negotiation that had already been decided by Nikephorus and that all Michael did was just sign off on it. But again, it's kind of hard to know. The evidence is not entirely clear on exactly when this agreement was made and then when it was signed. Although we do know it was definitely signed, I think, actually under Leo V. So a little bit later still than Michael. But at any rate, either Nikephorus or Michael was the one who negotiated it. Um, and it does show a lot of continuity between different emperors that they all were on the same page about this. So it's possible it was actually just some advisor who came up with this and it had very little to do with any of the three emperors I just mentioned. But anyway, let's move on and talk about uh, Michael's real problems. In the spring of 812, Con Crum seized the Veltus. This was a fortified Byzantine town on the Black Sea coast, and it controlled a coastal road that was pretty vital for trade. Um, Crum relocated a lot of the inhabitants there to his own lands, and that included a bishop. So, for Michael, this was an outrage and something that he would have to address. So he mobilized his army in June, and he marched out to try to find and confront Crum. Unfortunately, his army was newly raised, not really trained, and not very well disciplined. So they mutinied early on and prevented Michael from making a date with Crum. So this caused a widespread panic among Byzantine subjects in Thrace and Macedonia, and many of them fled to safer regions. So at this point, it looked like Michael was in danger of allowing the gains that Nikephorus had made in the Balkans to slip away so he had to do something to shore up his army. At this point, Michael surely had the wherewithal to realize that his army was unable to cope with the threat that it faced in 812, but it would be several months before his army was able to cope with the Bulgars. In the meanwhile, his lands were being laid waste and he was losing key frontier strongholds. The cities of Ancylius and Baro both fell, those were key frontier strongholds, and you can imagine that this would have been very frustrating to army officials who knew that these areas would be very difficult to reclaim. The panic spread as far south as Philippolis, which was the chief city of western Thrace, and this also means that the Byzantine officials in cities like Adrianople and elsewhere are probably having to deal with a bit of a refugee crisis. So I'm sure that they also were not very pleased with the way that things had gone. At this point, things are looking pretty bad, and Crum proposes peace on the condition that Michael hand over all of the Bulgar prisoners and deserters. There were probably still quite a number from the early stages of the Pliska campaign when um, Nikephorus' forces had actually been fairly successful. However, for whatever reason, Michael found that to be unacceptable, and he rejected the offer. And Crum's counter was to lay siege to the city of Mesembria which was a long, a long, slender peninsula. And this should not have been a major problem. In theory, the Byzantine fleet should be able to easily resupply this place. It's not somewhere that you can take by land without a fleet, and Crum had no fleet. The Byzantines did. However, for whatever reason, the Byzantine navy was not really up to par. And it's kind of an unaccountable thing, and it must have been especially embarrassing given Michael's naval roots and his father's reputation as an admiral. So, without this Byzantine naval support, the city of Mesembria goes hungry and they're forced to surrender on November 5th. 
and this might actually be the worst single event of the year 812 for Michael. Going into 813, it was pretty clear to Michael that he was in a lot of trouble. He knew that his only real chance of trying to save his throne was to meet and defeat Crum in an open battle, and even then his position would not be fully secure unless he was able to win further successes in other arenas. But you had to start somewhere. The disasters that had occurred since Pliska had really helped to revive the Iconoclast cause, and even some of Constantine V's elderly sons were hopeful that they might get a shot at the throne. A lot of them had been mutilated, so I'm not really sure exactly what uh, hope they realistically had, but hey, uh, who knows? I guess hope springs eternal. Generals and troops in Asia uh, had to be brought over to really shore up Michael's army, and they were not impressed by Michael's generalship early on as he led them out in the field and delayed the engagement with Crumb's army. So they were out in the field for a couple months not really doing anything before Michael started to move them toward a position where they might actually find Crumb. In the summer of 813, Michael took his newly reinforced army into the field in Thrace and proceeded to not really do anything for an entire month. And if you're wondering why that's a problem, here's why. If you know anything about Roman or Byzantine armies, you know that they are very, very, very easily offended by their commanders. And the worst way to offend them, other than not paying them, is to refrain from engaging in battle because they take that as an insult to their fighting prowess because if their general believed in them properly and understood their true combat value, then he would not show such hesitancy. So, by showing this hesitancy, Michael was alienating his troops. Eventually, though, Michael does enter into enemy territory, and by this point, this enemy territory extends pretty close to his own borders, he ended up engaging not far from Adrianople at a place called Versenicia. And, in general, the Bulgars had a policy of avoiding major battles, with the exception of Pliska, where they had ambushed a Byzantine army passing through a narrow area, the Bulgars were not really fond of open battles, and this had been a strategy to serve them pretty well. However, for whatever reason, Khan, uh, Krum felt pretty confident, and Michael was eventually goaded by his generals and men into attacking on June 21st. The battle was actually going pretty well at first, and it had kind of proved the former wisdom of Crum to not engage in open battles as he was on the, you know, cusp of receiving a major defeat. But then, unexpectedly, the Anatolian troops under the general Leo the Armenian quit the field, and that was half the army. And then that left Crum alone where he could rally his men and win the battle. Now, there are quite a few suspicions about what happened and whether this was prearranged between Leo and Crum, but I won't get into that until I talk about Leo V. So, we'll save that discussion for a future date. But at any rate, the Battle of Versenicia resulted in yet another great victory for Crum and another crushing and humiliating defeat for the Byzantines. And this time, it was a completely avoidable defeat that the Byzantines um, should not have suffered so it kind of makes it worse in a way. Quick note, if you happen to catch a hint of some kind of tune in the background, that is because one of my neighbors has their stereo cranked all the way up, and I can't really do anything about that. So bonus points to anyone who can hear it and guess what song is currently playing. We'll see if anyone is able to figure it out or if it's even audible. At any rate, um, after the disaster at Versenicia, Crum was then able to march all the way to Constantinople and camp beneath the walls in July. And between the defection, the defeat, and then Crum being camped at the gates, Michael's spirit was totally broken, and he supposedly said something to the effect that God must not like the dynasty of Nikephorus. And when he reached the city of Constantinople, he met with Patriarch Nikephorus and told him that it was his intention to abdicate from the throne. And for his part, the Patriarch did not object. He thought that, yeah, Michael kind of sucked at being emperor. Um, so Michael abdicated and became a monk. And let's look at his long post-imperial career briefly. 
The post-imperial career of Michael I closely mirrors that of Theodosius III a century before. Both men entered the church along with their sons, and in both cases, both men found peace in their new profession, and both of their sons found great success within the church. So, let's take a look here. After his abdication in 813, Michael took the monastic name of Athanasius and lived peacefully until his death in 844. So he ended up enjoying a pretty long life, which is fairly unusual for someone who was emperor and then was deposed. Michael's sons, unfortunately for them, were castrated and also forced to go into monasteries, lest they take up the banner of the Nikiforan dynasty at a later date. One son, Nikitas, took the monastic name Ignatius and later became the Patriarch of Constantinople, and he actually was a pretty famous one at that. This is a drawing of him in a church. So, um, you know, pretty successful post-imperial career all in all, um, and that is again not a thing that is very common in Byzantine history. So it points to maybe the fact that Michael I was not someone who was actually all that eager to rule, and he certainly wasn't going to fight for a throne that he thought was not destined to remain his. The legacy of Michael I Rangabi is a bit difficult to assess. His weakness nearly undid all of Nikephorus's gains in the Balkans, however he didn't reign long enough or fail hard enough to make that happen so it ended up not really being much of a legacy in that respect. His failure also ensured the end of the Nikephoran dynasty, and of course his abdication included his sons getting castrated, so that also brought an end to the Rangabi family. Um, but this failure compounded upon the failures that had occurred all the way dating back to Irene, and then really brought home by Pliska and Versinicia, really set the stage for a second round of iconoclasm. So I would say that if any one person was really central in inadvertently making the case for iconoclasm to come back, it was actually Michael I. And if I had to really assess him overall, I mean, Michael I Rangabi was one of the least talented emperors in Byzantium's history. This guy was simply not suited for imperial power. He didn't have it. But he doesn't really seem to have been a bad person. Uh, people seem to have liked him relatively well. He seems to have been trustworthy to the point that someone like Leo V could allow him to go into a monastery and never really have to worry about Michael re-emerging or betraying the agreement that they had reached. So there are some honorable traits to Michael, even if he really is not very talented or impressive in any other respect. <laughs> 